Chapter 4 Ants All during dinner, Rose felt that she was going to be talked about, and afterward she was sure of it, for Aunt Plenty whispered to her as they went into the parlor, Run up and sit a while with Sister Peace, my dear. She likes to have you read while she rests, and we are going to be busy. Rose obeyed, and the quiet rooms above were so like a church that she soon composed her ruffled feelings, and was unconsciously a little minister of happiness to the sweet old lady, who for years had sat there patiently waiting to be set free from pain. Rose knew the sad romance of her life, and it gave a certain tender charm to this great aunt of hers, whom she already loved. When peace was twenty, she was about to be married. All was done. The wedding dress lay ready. The flowers were waiting to be put on, the happy hour at hand. When word came that the lover was dead. They thought that gentle peace would die, too. But she bore it bravely, put away her bridal gear, took up her life afresh, and lived on. A beautiful, meek woman, with hair as white as snow, and cheeks that never bloomed again. She wore no black, but soft, pale colors, as if always ready for the marriage that had never come. For thirty years she had lived on, fading slowly, but cheerful, busy, and full of interest in all that went on in the family, especially the joys and sorrows of the young girls growing up about her. To them she was adviser, confidant, and friend in all their tender trials and delights. A truly beautiful woman, with her silvery hair, tranquil face, and an atmosphere of repose about her that soothed whoever came to her. Aunt Plenty was utterly dissimilar, being a stout, brisk old lady, with a sharp eye, a lively tongue, and a face like a winter apple. Always trotting, chatting, and bustling, she was a regular Martha, cumbered with the cares of this world, and quite happy in them. Rose was right. While she softly read psalms to Aunt Peace, the other ladies were talking about her little self in the frankest manner. "'Well, Alec, how do you like your ward?' began Aunt Jane, as they all settled down, and Uncle Mac deposited himself in a corner to finish his doze. "'I should like her better if I could have begun at the beginning, and so got a fair start. Poor George led such a solitary life that the child has suffered in many ways, and since he died, she has been going on worse than ever.' "'judging from the state I find her in.' "'My dear boy, we did what we thought best "'while waiting for you to wind up your affairs and get home. "'I always told George he was wrong to bring her up as he did, "'but he never took my advice, "'and now here we are with this poor dear child upon our hands. "'I, for one, freely confess that I don't know what to do with her "'any more than if she was one of those strange, outlandish birds.' you used to bring home from foreign parts. And Aunt Plenty gave her a perplexed shake of the head, which caused great commotion among the stiff loops of purple ribbon that bristled all over her cap like crocus buds. If my advice had been taken, she would have remained at the excellent school where I placed her. But our aunt thought best to remove her because she complained, and she has been dawdling about ever since she came. A most ruinous state of things for a morbid, spoiled girl like Rose said Mrs. Jane severely. She had never forgiven the old ladies for yielding to Rose's pathetic petition that she might wait her guardian's arrival before beginning another term at the school. I never thought it the proper school for a child in good circumstances, an heiress, in fact, as Rose is. It is all very well for girls who are to get their own living by teaching and that sort of thing. But all she needs is a year or two at a fashionable finishing school, so that at eighteen she can come out with eclat. Put in Aunt Clara, who had been a beauty and a belle, and was still a handsome woman. Dear, dear, how short-sighted you all are to be discussing education and plans for the future, when this unhappy child is so plainly marked for the tomb, sighed Aunt Myra, with a lugubrious sniff and a solemn wag of the funereal bonnet, which she refused to remove, being afflicted with a chronic guitar. Now it is my opinion that the dear thing only wants freedom, rest, and care. There is a look in her eye that goes to my heart, for it shows that she feels the need of what none of us can give her, a mother. 
said Aunt Jessie with tears in her own bright eyes, at the thought of her boys being left, as Rose was, to the care of others. Uncle Alec, who had listened silently as each spoke, turned quickly toward the last sister, and said with a decided nod of approval, "'You've got it, Jessie, and with you to help me, I hope to make the child feel that she is not quite fatherless and motherless.' "'I'll do my best, Alec, and I think you will need me, for wise as you are, you cannot understand a tender, timid little creature like Rose as a woman can,' said Mrs. Jessie, smiling back at him with a heart full of motherly goodwill. "'I cannot help feeling that I, who have had a daughter of my own, can best bring up a girl, and I am very much surprised that George did not entrust her to me.' observed Aunt Myra with an air of melancholy importance, for she was the only one who had given a daughter to the family, and she felt that she had distinguished herself, though ill-natured people said that she had dosed her darling to death. I never blamed him in the least when I remembered the perilous experiment you tried with poor Carrie, began Aunt Jane in her hard voice. Jane Campbell, I will not hear a word. My sainted Caroline is a sacred subject cried Aunt Myra, rising as if to leave the room. Uncle Alec detained her, feeling that he must define his position at once, and maintain it manfully, if he hoped to have any success in his new undertaking. Now, my dear old souls, don't let us quarrel and make Rose a bone of contention, though, upon my word, she is almost a bone, poor little lass. You have had her among you for a year, and done what you liked. I cannot say that your success is great, but that is owing to too many fingers in the pie. Now, I intend to try my way for a year, and if, at the end of it, she is not in better trim than now, I'll give up the case and hand her over to someone else. That's fair, I think. She will not be here a year hence, poor darling, so no one need dread future responsibility, said Aunt Myra, folding her black gloves as if all ready for the funeral. "'By Jupiter, Myra, you are enough to damp the ardor of a saint,' cried Dr. Alec with a sudden spark in his eyes. "'Your croaking will worry that child out of her wits, for she is an imaginative puss, and will fret and fancy untold horrors. You have put it into her head that she has no constitution, and she rather likes the idea. If she had not had a pretty good one, she would have been marked for the tomb by this time, at the rate you have been going on with her.' I will not have any interference. Please understand that. So just wash your hands of her and let me manage till I want help. Then I'll ask for it. Here, here, came from the corner, where Uncle Mac was apparently wrapped in slumber. You were appointed guardian, and so we can do nothing. But I predict that the girl will be spoiled, utterly spoiled, answered Mrs. Jane grimly. Thank you, sister. I have an idea that if a woman can bring up two boys as perfectly as you do yours, a man, if he devotes his whole mind to it, may at least attempt as much with one girl, replied Dr. Alec with a humorous look that tickled the others immensely, for it was a well-known fact in the family that Jane's boys were more indulged than all the other lads put together. I am quite easy, for I really do think that Alec will improve the child's health, and by the time his year is out, it will be quite soon enough for her to go to Madame Roccabella's and be finished off, said Aunt Clara, settling her rings and thinking with languid satisfaction of the time when she could bring out a pretty and accomplished niece. I suppose you will stay here in the old place, unless you think of marrying, and it's high time you did, put in Mrs. Jane, much nettled at her brother's last hit. No, thank you. Come and have a cigar, Mac, said Dr. Alec abruptly. Don't marry. Women enough in the family already, muttered Uncle Mac. Then the gentleman hastily fled. Aunt Peace would like to see you all, she says, was the message Rose brought before the ladies could begin talking again. Hectic, hectic. Dear me, dear me, murmured Aunt Myra as the shadow of her gloomy bonnet fell upon Rose and the stiff tips of a black glove touched the cheek where the color deepened under so many eyes. "'I am glad these pretty curls are natural. "'They will be invaluable by and by,' said Aunt Clara, "'taking an observation with her head on one side. "'Now that your uncle has come, "'I no longer expect you to review the studies of the past year. 
I trust your time will not be entirely wasted in frivolous sports, however, added Aunt Jane, sailing out of the room with the air of a martyr. Aunt Jessie said not a word, but kissed her little niece with a look of tender sympathy that made Rose cling to her a minute, and followed her with grateful eyes as the door closed behind her. After everybody had gone home, Dr. Alec paced up and down the lower hall in the twilight for an hour, thinking so intently that sometimes he frowned, sometimes he smiled, and more than once he stood still in a brown study. All of a sudden, he said, half aloud, as if he had made up his mind, I might as well begin at once and give the child something new to think about, for Myra's dismals and Jane's lectures have made her as blue as a little indigo bag. Diving into one of the trunks that stood in a corner, he brought up, after a brisk rummage, a silken cushion, prettily embroidered, and a quaint cup of dark, beautifully carved wood. This will do for a start, he said, as he plumped up the cushion and dusted the cup. It won't do to begin too energetically, or Rose will be frightened. I must beguile her gently and pleasantly along till I've won her confidence, and then she will be ready for anything. Just then, Phoebe came out of the dining room with a plate of brown bread, for Rose had been allowed no hot biscuit for tea. I'll relieve you of some of that, said Dr. Alec, and helping himself to a generous slice, he retired to the study, leaving Phoebe to wonder at his appetite. She would have wondered still more if she had seen him making that brown bread into neat little pills, which he packed into an attractive ivory box, out of which he emptied his own bits of lovage. There, if they insist on medicine, I'll order these, and no harm will be done. I will have my own way, but I'll keep the peace, if possible, and confess the joke when my experiment has succeeded, he said to himself, looking very much like a mischievous boy, as he went off with his innocent prescription of pills. Rose was playing softly on the small organ that stood in the upper hall, so that Aunt Peace could enjoy it, and all the while he talked with the old ladies. Uncle Alec was listening to the fitful music of the child and thinking of another Rose who used to play for him. As the clock struck eight, he called out, Time for my girl to be abed, else she won't be up early, and I'm full of jolly plans for tomorrow. Come and see what I found for you to begin upon. Rose ran in and listened with bright, attentive face, while Dr. Alec said impressively, In my wanderings over the face of the earth, I have picked up some excellent remedies, and as they are rather agreeable ones, I think you and I will try them. This is an herb pillow given to me by a wise old woman when I was ill in India. It is filled with saffron, poppies, and other soothing plants. So lay your little head on it tonight, sleep sweetly without a dream, and wake tomorrow without a pain. Shall I, really? How nice it smells. And Rose willingly received the pretty pillow, and stood enjoying its faint, sweet odor as she listened to the doctor's next remedy. This is the cup I told you of. Its virtue deepens, they say, on the drinker filling it himself. So you must learn to milk. I'll teach you. I'm afraid I never can, said Rose, but she surveyed the cup with favor, for a funny little imp danced on the handle, as if all ready to take a header into the white sea below. Don't you think she ought to have something more strengthening than milk, Alec? I really shall feel anxious if she does not have a tonic of some sort, said Aunt Plenty, eyeing the new remedy suspiciously, for she had more faith in her old-fashioned doses than all the magic cups and poppy pillows of the East. Well, ma'am, I'm willing to give her a pill, if you think best. It is a very simple one, and very large quantities may be taken without harm. You know hashish is the extract of hemp? Well, this is a preparation of corn and rye, much used in old times, and I hope it will be again. Dear me, how singular! said Aunt Plenty, bringing her spectacles to bear upon the pills, with a face so full of respectful interest that it was almost too much for Dr. Alec's gravity. "'Take one in the morning, and a good night to you, my dear,' he said, dismissing his patient with a hearty kiss. Then as she vanished, he put both hands into his hair, exclaiming, with a comical mixture of anxiety and amusement, "'When I think what I have undertaken, I declare to you, Aunt,' I feel like running away and not coming back till Rose is eighteen. 
End of Chapter 4 Recording by Maria Therese